This is Deterrorizing Scary Verses. This is a series which explores verses which religion has perverted in order to abuse, intimidate, control, manipulate, and terrorize people into making an oath of fealty to a deranged, tyrannical, intolerant, inhospitable, abusive, controlling, insecure, vengeful, angry, detached, uncaring, callous, cruel sky deity who lives on planet Third Heaven, a place so distant, cold, and inhumane that it can only be reached by the dead. This goes further than merely looking at the forgiveness filter as a means to discredit those verses that are used to terrorize you and takes a little bit more in-depth look. Now the forgiveness filter is that your Bible interpretation, in fact all things in heaven and earth, must bow down and plant their face in the dirt to Jesus proclaiming forgiveness. Jesus proclaimed forgiveness to the joy, praise, and honor of the Father, while enthroned on the cross and crowned with our sin. His justice is mercy, his judgment is forgiveness, his chastisement is healing, his wrath is reconciliation, his retribution is restoration, he exercises authority by serving. His love is freely given and is fulfilled in the giving. His love requires no reciprocation. And so, what you need to understand is that your interpretation of the Bible needs to bow down to what Jesus proclaimed while enthroned on the cross, which was forgiveness. So, whatever you think a verse says, if it is not consistent and harmonious with Jesus proclaiming forgiveness, then you need to either shelve it or wholesale recognize it as wrong. Because Jesus' proclamation of forgiveness does not bow down to you or anyone else's interpretation of what you think the Bible says if that is not harmonious with his forgiveness. If it is not harmonious with what he has proclaimed, then it is incorrect, or at the very least it is something that you're not fully comprehending or understanding correctly. And so we're going to look at these verses that are used in order to abuse people. We know that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But religion wants to tell you that there's something that's not forgiven. There's something that separates you from God and that God is either incapable of forgiving or unwilling to forgive. And so, despite the fact that 1 John 4 says, Herein is love not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, almost all of religion has some form of limited atonement, wherein the propitiation for sins is not made. There's something that is outstanding that is not propitiated. So whether this is Calvinist limited atonement, in which Jesus actually is not the Savior of the whole world, he's the Savior of the elect, he only died for the sins of the elect, and for everyone else, what he did has nothing to do with them. Or whether you have a limitation on the effectiveness. There's something wherein you and I must do something, and so... Whether he's effective in propitiating your sin or not is up to, to you and I and what we accomplish. So perhaps Christ is dead in vain because we know that if righteousness is by the law, which is by keeping of rules, then Christ is dead in vain. So most of religion has a Christ who is either didn't die for the whole world, is not the savior of the whole world, or is not the propitiation for all of our sins. Because in one way or another, Christ is dead in vain because the performance is up to you and I to determine whether he's been effective in his role and in his goal. So it's actually a foundational and important principle to most of religion that something is unforgivable. And so let's take a look at this because I know that even amongst people with a message of grace that it's pretty common that they will say Jesus died for all sins except for unbelief. And so let's take a look at what we have here. And we're going to see that 
it says in John chapter 3, verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And in Hebrews 11, and verse, I'm losing my place here, in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we can see that Jesus is the Savior of the world, and, the, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but of the whole world, except for unbelief. So as long as you have believed that Jesus is the Son of God, then you're cool, you're good, you can, you can have your eternal security. You, you have your once saved, always saved. So as long as you got that, you're good. If you, don't, if you don't believe, that's the one thing that Jesus didn't forgive. So even though Jeremiah says that forgiveness is an honor and a praise and a joy to God, he sometimes deprives himself of that honor and joy and praise in order to... I'm not really sure what it is that he's accomplishing, but he intentionally deprives himself of joy, honor, and praise by not forgiving unbelief. But as long as you believe, you're okay. So, the other thing is that uh, if you take the mark of the beast, that would be another thing. So, it says here in Revelations verse tw chapter 19 and verse 20, it says, And the beast was taken, and him with the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. And then that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So as long as you don't take the mark of the beast, whatever that means, and you're not in unbelief, then you're safe. You're good. So Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, except for unbelief and taking the mark of the beast, whatever that means. But as long as you don't have those things going for you, you're okay. Except for if you sin willfully. Because in Hebrews 10.26 it tells us, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And this is where we get a, a very popular doctrine, which is once lost, always lost. So, we know that if you sin on purpose, then you're, you're permanently lost which would mean that that's something that's not forgiven. So as long as you are not in unbelief and you don't take the mark of the beast and you don't sin on purpose, then everything is forgiven and you're good and you can have your eternal security. Unless you have some unconfessed sin. Because we see in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us all from all unrighteousness. You know, and, and it's very important. That's a big if right there, if we confess our sins. So we can understand that as long as you're not in un unbelief, and you don't take the mark of the beast, and you don't sin on purpose, and you make sure that you confess all your sins, then you're covered. So those are the only things that you, that, those are the only things that aren't forgiven. But we see in Revelation 22:15 that without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So as long as you aren't a dog, a sorcerer, a whoremonger, a murderer, idolater, or a liar, and you don't sin on purpose and you confess all your sins and you're not in unbelief and you don't take the mark of the beast, then you're safe. Jesus, those, those are the only things that Jesus didn't die for. But other than that, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. The propitiation of our sins, and not for our sins only, but the whole world. Other than that, everything is forgivable. Those are the only things that God doesn't forgive. Except that list was a little bit incomplete, and we just want to make sure that we complete the list. So in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So, 
as long as you don't do any of those things. And we also want to cross-reference that with Galatians 5, 19 to 21. And we see, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you do any of those things, you probably are in trouble. That, that's probably stuff that Jesus is not the propitiation for those sins. Okay, so we've got, as long as you're not in unbelief, don't take the mark of the beast. Don't sin on purpose. Don't have anything unconfessed. And you're not a dog, a sorcerer, a whoremonger, a murderer, a liar, a fornicator, an idolater, an adulterer, a feminine, an abuser of yourself with mankind, a thief, covetous, a drunkard, a reviler, an extortioner, or all these other things that you know were, were, are covered here in Galatians 5, then you've got your eternal security. So is that that those are the things that Jesus was the propitiation for for our sins except those. So those were the exceptions. And and other than that there's well in Romans 1 okay, so so there is another loophole in Romans 128 and we know, you know, since religion tells us that this is about homosexuality, we know that must be true. Because religion's never wrong about anything. And so in verse 28 of Romans 1, it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. None of these have anything to do with homosexuality. Murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil thing, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God. Could the judgment of God be forgiveness? That they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So, being homosexual, that that's your reprobate, you're beyond salvation. So, as long as you do that, as, or don't do that, or are in unbelief, or take the mark of the beast, or sin on purpose, or don't confess something, and then that whole list of things there, Except for that, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but of the whole world. But, or, you know, just of the people that don't do any of these loopholes here that he didn't cover when his propitiation was not really that effective. Um, other than that, um, I think we're probably finally got everything that that that's actually forgiven other than those things um and not bearing fruit cuz in John 15:2 it says every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and every bre branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit and then if we skip to verse 6 because we want to ignore the context. We, we can jump right to this part. It says, He is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And we won't look at who it is that gathers them, because that would be men, and that makes it seem confusing, because then it doesn't have anything to do with God. Um, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So if you don't bear fruit, you're burned. That's, that's, that's it. You're, you're, you're toast. You're crispy. So that's not... If you don't bear fruit, then that's not forgiven. Um, but other than that, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and the Savior of the world. Um, so don't buy into this concept of limited atonement because we see that Jesus 
he covered everything. You know, the the sacrifices in the mosaic system, you brought your sacrifice and you were good until, you know, at least for the next year when you brought more sacrifices. But with the, you know, Jesus is better than that. So he, his, his offering is good for all time for, for everything that's in the book of Hebrews, you know, once for all, um, except for these things. And uh, also, we see in Matthew 5 a whole bunch of things that you might go to hell. So these aren't forgivable. So um, you need to pluck out body parts and, and, and dismember yourself to make sure that you're safe. So we see in 529 of Matthew, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Um, so you want to make sure that you chop off these body parts if they're causing you to sin, because we all know body parts are the things that cause you to sin. Let's ignore the part where he was talking about how your thoughts are what provoke you to take these kinds of actions that are the ones that you shouldn't take. And, you know, equating your thought life with the issue. It's your body parts that are the offending members. So cut those off and then you'll be safe because we want to make sure we, I mean, we don't want to buy into some false principle of eternal security or this heretical idea that God keeps no records of wrongs or that forgiveness is actually a joy and a praise and an honor to God and that Jesus is the propitiation for the whole world. Because if we buy into those heretical ideas, that's, you know, we've got nothing to divide us from one another and to, and to look down upon other people and to say, you know, your state in life is your own fault. And so make sure you cut off body parts. Um, this is also confirmed further in Matthew chapter 18. And it says, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, Cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed. Wait, enter into, shouldn't I say enter into death? Afterlife, maybe? Rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye. Rather, why doesn't it say into afterlife? Or kingdom of planet third heaven? Or Something like, why does it say into life? With one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. So, and then we've got another, I mean, if you want, you know, triple affirmation, chop off your body parts because you want to be safe. These body parts are making you sin and you need to stop. Um, So in Mark chapter 9, we got the same thing confirmed. It says, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm dieth not and their fire is not quenched and if thy foot offend thee you know because my feet make me sin all the time you know and i i'm just i'm a filthy reprobate because i still have my feet um but if i would heed the word i would cut them off and It would be better for me to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm dieth not and their fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. I don't know what that means. But it's clear. It's a clear message. Jesus is really hammering down. You're going to go to hell if you don't chop your body parts off. Um, and, you know, so we can go back to the Old Testament and we can find out that if you're not circumcised, so if somebody hasn't mutilated your genitalia, then you're going to, you, you, it's no good. So you want to chop off that body part too if that, if that wasn't done for you already. In Genesis 17.4, and the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people he hath broken my covenant. 
So since we see that the word soul is there, we know that this is talking about when you die and go to hell. Um, so if you if you haven't snipped the tip to be righteous, you're in trouble. But you want to make sure w while we're here cutting off body parts that make you sin, if your privy member makes you sin, you want to be careful. Don't cut that off all the way. Because in Deuteronomy 23.1, it says, He is the, that is wounded in the stones, or hath his privy member cut off, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. So we know that means die and go to heaven. So if you if you cut too much, or you think, you know, this part of me is making me sin, it's not better to cut that part off, even if it's making you sin. Because that would be one of the things that's not covered. Um, so... Cut off your body parts, but not that part, but just enough, just the tip, um, and then you're safe. But other than that, Jesus is the Savior of the world. Other than those couple things that weren't covered, um, those were, were, were pretty much closed down to the exceptions to what Jesus did. Other than that, he accomplished, he, he, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, not those who were lost, but never minding that, he, he mostly was a failure because these things weren't covered. Um, so other than that, the only thing, make sure that you're afraid of God. So you have to be afraid of God because in Luke 12, in verse 5 it says, But I will forewarn you of whom ye shall fear. Fear him, which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Um, so make sure you're afraid of God. Um, forgiveness, don't, don't take that too far because you, you need to make sure that you don't take forgiveness to the point where you're no longer afraid of God. That would be bad. Um, so other than that, just m make sure you help the needy because um, not helping the needy would be one of the things that's not forgiven. Um, so we see in Matthew chapter 25, it says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when we saw thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee, then shall he say, answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. So as much as you didn't do it to the, to the needy, you didn't do it to me. And, and so if you don't help the needy, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So if you don't help the needy, that would be one of those things that Jesus is not the propitiation for not helping the needy and for unbelief and mark of the beast and sinning on purpose and not confessing sin and being a whole list of things that you're not allowed to be and not cutting off body parts and not helping the needy and not being afraid of God. But other than that, Jesus is the Savior of the world and the propitiation for our sins. Um, unless you're wearing the wrong clothes or no clothes, I'm not clear, um, at the wedding. So sometime after we die, we're going to go to a wedding and it's going to be great, but make sure you're wearing the right clothes when you die and go to the wedding because we see in Matthew 22 and 11, and it says, And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man which had not on a wedding garment. So I don't know if he was naked or just wearing the wrong thing. But he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So, make sure you got the right clothes when you die and go to the wedding. Um, other than that, we're good. Other than that, we can, we can have our eternal security. We can feel safe. We can know God is good. 
God is love. God keeps no record of wrongs. There is no fear in love. Don't don't be afraid except for, you know, making sure that you're afraid of God. Because if you're not afraid, you might go to hell when you die. Um, other than that, I think, um, well, you don't want to be drunk at the wrong time. Or I might be I might be reading that wrong. It might not be that being drunk at the wrong time is it might be beating your servant or it might be if you don't if you're not watching when the rapture happens. I'm not really sure which or maybe it's a combination of things. But it says here in Matthew chapter 24 it says in verse 48, but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart my lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, I mean, it does say he was smiting his fellow servants and he was getting drunk, but also he wasn't looking for the rapture. So, it, I'm not sure. You just make sure you don't do any of those things. And then you should be you should be safe. You should be okay. Jesus is the propitiation for most sins, except for most of them. Um, so that that would be a problem. But other than that, the only thing you have to worry about is being an unprofitable servant. Because if we, in the parable that the guy that buried the one, we see Matthew twenty five thirty and Cassie the unprofitable servant into outer darkness which we know is just another way of saying hell after you die, eternal conscious torment. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And there's the proof right there. I mean, you, you don't need any further proof than that. There's n Nobody has ever wept or gnashed their teeth while still alive. Um, so clearly, this is don't be an unprofitable servant or bury your talent. Um, other than that, I think... Jesus is the propitiation for most of the other rest of the... I'm not really clear on what he actually covered. I'm, I'm starting to get a little confused, but let's just keep going. Um, and I might have gotten this one wrong too, because I'm not sure if the problem is that you say, Lord, Lord, or if it's boasting in your works, or if maybe even that's a wrong interpretation. But I'm kind of, I'm leaning towards many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That if they had just said, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? I think he's irritated that they're repeating it. Um, so just be careful because it might be that if you just were to say, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? But that might be wrong. It, it might be you shouldn't boast in your works. So it might not be that they said, Lord, Lord, twice. But either way, the, the, the important thing is that it says, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. There, See, see, boasting in their works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. It, but let's not dismiss the fact, because if we, we can confirm this in Luke 13, and it says, again, it says in verse chapter 13, verse 25, when once the master of the house has risen up and has shut to the door, you begin to stand without and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, see there it is twice. Open up unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not once you are. Then you shall begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence. Well, that doesn't really sound like boasting in works. It's just kind of saying like, Hey, dude, we hung out. Um, and thou hast in our streets. But he shall say, So this is, I mean, this is really making me think because there's no boasting in works here. So I think it's that they say it twice. So make sure you don't ever say Lord and then say Lord again. He doesn't like that. Um, and he's going to say to you, I know not whence you are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourself thrust out. So um, make sure you don't boast in your works and you don't say Lord 
twice in a row. Just just to be safe, just to be careful, because Jesus is the Savior of the world, and love keeps no record of wrongs, and Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but of the whole world. Except we just you don't want to you don't want to. I mean, I wouldn't want to tell somebody that they're okay and have overlooked something and may, you know I don't want to be the guy that didn't warn that didn't warn people so you know it, just be careful don't say Lord Lord um, maybe you could even say like Lord Jesus you know that way you, you don't repeat it would be I just I, I really I, I have this heart of compassion I, I don't want to see anybody die and go to hell um and so we we need to be clear on these things and not buy into this false doctrine of eternal security or these heretical doctrines where Jesus is the savior of the whole world and uh you know the propitiation for our sins and not ours only but of the whole world and that God is love we, we take that too far and say well if God is love and love keeps no record of wrongs and God keeps no record of wrongs so he's not keeping a list of all these things that aren't forgiven um clearly you know maybe even saying lord lord i i might be in trouble i gotta confess this <sighs> um so other than that i think we're safe we're good there, there isn't any such thing as an unforgivable sin i think probably if you confess them and you repent and you you just really cry big crocodile tears and make a false confession God, I will never do this again. I promise. I promise. I mean, I'm going to break the promise, but I promise that I I wish I could keep the promise. Um so as long as you wish that you could keep the promise. God God loves when you make false promises, but just cuz you wish that they weren't false, that's the important thing. So make false promises to God to stop doing these things, but but mean it at least as far as wanting to keep the promise, even though the promise itself is completely phony and unrealistic. So that's the important thing. Your your tears need to be really big. You need to cry. Um, it needs to be really sincere or at least look convincing. Um, that's the important thing. Um and so other than that, the only thing you need to worry about is that if whosoever shall deny me before men, him will also I deny before my Father which is in heaven. So don't make a public denial. Make sure that you make a con public confession of faith because Matthew 10.33 makes it clear. If you, if you don't, then Jesus is going to point the finger at you and say, you know, he doesn't belong here or she doesn't belong here. It's pretty clear that those, but maybe with enough big enough tears, and a and a believable enough false promise that you'll stop being such a filthy, disgusting sinner. Maybe maybe Jesus will be the propitiation for for those sins, and he won't be dead in vain, because you'll have done your part. Wait, that would that would make him dead in vain. I think I'm I think I'm I think I'm short circuiting my thought process here. Okay, so maybe you'll have kept enough rules and done a good enough job on your own for Christ to be dead in vain. Wait, that sounds like it wouldn't be a good thing. All right, I, let's just let's let's move on. I don't want to get too too confused here because um. Other than that, I think we're we're probably good. Um, yeah, and so yeah, that that would be it. Uh, he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. It, there it is, Luke twelve nine. It, it was the, it was there again. There was a, another confirmation. Make sure that you've got that public confession and those big tears with your false promises to 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 repent and to stop behaving with all these things that Jesus only covers them if you've covered them because he's 
I'm getting confused again about this dead and vain thing. Okay, so if you keep rules for your righteousness, then Christ is dead in vain. So make sure you kept all these rules because he didn't forgive those ones. Um, all right, so anyway, um, let's just let's shelve that. We don't want to get confused about what is or is not forgiven um, and what your part is. Um, actually, that's pretty much the central focus of almost all religion. Um, okay, so not believing in hell, that would be another thing. If you don't believe in eternal conscious torment especially, but if you don't believe in some kind of afterlife, dis either dis disposal unit or or torture chamber that's heretical that okay and i do i have zero bible references to back that up but it's definitely there and also if you don't have a correct view on the trinity if if you if you're askew if you have some heresy like modalism or or you tried to turn it into some kind of cosmic anatomy instead of just an illustration of unity, and you know, it, and and you you didn't get that right, and you don't have your doctrine quite right. I think that probably you can go to hell for that. And if you don't properly ascribe to the uh, your denomination's view on the rapture and end times, I'm pretty sure that's not forgiven either. Um, and again, I don't have any references for any of these. This is just, I mean, but it's clearly important because every denomination that I know of makes it really, really important. Um, you're a heretic if you don't have these things right. And one thing I do know is that teaching heresy, that's a no-no. No good. Um, that's not forgiven. And we see that in Second Peter chapter 2. And verse 1, it says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So, destruction obviously means eternal conscious torment. Um, you know, I mean, it doesn't say that, but we need to eisegesis, you know, read that into the text that destruction or death or fire or perish or anywhere we see these words, we want to turn that into eternal conscious torment after you die. I know that's a lot of extra words that we're throwing into the text that aren't there, but we want to make sure that we understand destruction means eternal conscious torment after you die. And so teaching heresies like that there's no eternal conscious torment after you die, it, that's going to cause you to go to eternal conscious torment after you die. Um, that's not forgiven. Um, and, and so other than that, I think we're safe. We're good. Um, we can have our eternal security. We can feel good. We can recognize that God is love. Jesus is the savior of the world. We have victory, you know, let's celebrate glory. Hallelujah. Um, we've got our victory. If we do all these things and, and keep all these rules, and other than that, the only thing that might be a problem is the one thing that actually, at least by the way it seems to be translated and seems to be interpreted, actually does explicitly say it's not forgiven, and that's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And so, in Matthew twelve thirty one, it says... Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Which, the world to come, uh, wait, the world is in italics. Uh, that means it's not actually there. Um, but clearly, this is talking about when you die. Because this world would be would be Earth, and then the world to come would be when you die and go to planet Heaven or die and go to planet Hell. Um, and so, it's not going to be forgiven. And we can confirm this in Mark chapter 3. 
And it says in verse 28, Verily I say unto you, All sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies where with so ever sh they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. So there you go. Eternal damnation. It couldn't be any clearer than that. That's eternal conscious torment after you die. Never forgiveness. It's it's clearly God that's the one that's doing the not forgiving. Um, it doesn't say that, but we can definitely put that in the text that it's God who's doing the not forgiving and eternal damnation is by no means poetic it's absolutely literal um, it means it means pain that is unrelenting suffering that is without end it can't possibly refer to uh, you know because if you look at the Greek and I'm no Greek scholar but the the word that is translated here as damnation is crisis so it can't possibly be saying that if you have this view that he's criticizing, you would be in a state of continual crisis. And, hmm, that could... No, no, let's not confuse ourselves. We need to keep this eternal damnation as a perpetual suffering after you die. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. And so, Luke 12.10, it says... Ooh, look, we, we got this one here about the 12.9. He that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels. They strung these together. That's awesome. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. So there you go. Shall not be forgiven. It doesn't say that it's God who's doing the not forgiving. But we need to understand clearly it definitely is God who's doing the not forgiving. So, I brought up the idea that maybe damnation is a crisis. Maybe it's not eternal conscious torment after you die. So why don't we take a look at what is actually going on here in Matthew 12. Because I want to suggest to you that they were doing something that is very typical of religion today. So we see in Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, it says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? And if I be by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else... How can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man? And then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So let's just stop there for a moment, because what we see is that Jesus is healing people. So th this is talking about something that's being characterized as possessed of a devil blind and dumb and he healed him so it says healed he healed him and so Jesus is healing people and the Pharisees say that his healing is by the power of the devil the prince of devils Beelzebub and he says healing does not come from Satan and he's got some additional logic that he throws at them but the the imperative thing here is healing does not come from Satan Healing comes from God. And this is going to be, we're going to continue down this path. Healing comes from God. There is no such thing as some kind of satanic healing. This is what Jesus is telling the religious leadership. Do not attribute healing to something other than God. That's what blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is. They've attributed healing to something other than God. And this is very typical of religion today. To think that healing, someone could literally say, 
Hail Satan, I've been cured by this demonic power from this shaman or non-Christian who healed me. Because that's the way that a lot of religion is characterizing this. Now, in James 1, 16, 17, it says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Don't make a mistake. Do not fall into this error. What? What error? So he says, every good gift and every perfect gift, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So what this means is that if it's healing, it came from God. And it doesn't matter who it came through. It doesn't matter if it came through science, modern medicine, uh, an African witch doctor, uh, a Hindu, an atheist. If it is healing, it is not from the devil. And this is what Jesus is talking about to these people. Don't call this healing from the devil. Healing comes from God. So now, he has been accused of healing by the power of the devil. And he says, he gives a reasoning, saying, that's kind of stupid. Why, why would the devil undermine his own self by standing against himself? So in verse 31 of Matthew 12, it says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So now he says, don't attribute to the devil the power of God. Don't call healing something the devil is doing. Okay? Now if you do that, blasphemy is to equate something to, the, to God unjustly, unrightly. So they are unrightly elevating the devil to being God. That's blasphemy. Of the, that's what blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is. They have made the devil God. Ever heard any religious people make the devil God? Because guess what? If God is an accuser, that makes him the devil. If you die and God points a finger of accusation for you, your God is the devil. Okay? Now, if your God is the devil, how can you ever escape a crisis in which... You don't know if you're forgiven or not. So if you don't know if you're forgiven or not, because you look at healing, and even even looking at healing, you can't say, praise God for the healing that has been done. But you look at that healing and think, I wonder if the devil healed that person. You will be in a perpetual never-ending until you get over that or until you die crisis of wondering whether something is from God or whether something is from the devil because you don't have the wisdom to discern the difference that healing comes from God. Okay? This is not God not forgiving. This is you being stuck and trapped in a trap of your own mind, not knowing that you are forgiven. Wondering whether there's an unforgivable sin because you can't ever know that you're forgiven if you can't even trust that good things like healing might not be from God. If you you look at everything that happens and think, I wonder if this is a trick of the devil. You can't know forgiveness. That's what the point of this whole thing is. That's why this is the first one I'm attacking. Because if you don't know that something that is good comes from God, then you can't ever trust anything. And you're going to look at things and you're going to think, I wonder if this is a trick from the devil. And if you think, I wonder if this is a trick from the devil, you can never know your forgiveness. You can never experience it. You can never walk in it. You can never enter the kingdom of God, which is here, now, in this world, within you. It's Emmanuel, God with us and within us. It is here. It is now. It is something for you to experience in this life. Because God is not God of the dead, but of the living Okay, it's not about die and go to heaven. It's about experience the kingdom of heaven, which is here and now. So he continues in verse 33 of Matthew 12. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. So now he's continuing. This is going to take this is going to be a two-edged sword, right? Cuz on one hand, he's slicing away their idea that the devil can do healing. If healing is good, then the tree that produces that healing is good. So you're saying the devil is good? 
Or are you saying, you know, let's flip it back over. If the good tree is what produces the fruit, then the fruit can only be good. The, the good tree, good fruit. Bad tree, bad fruit. So God would be the good fruit. Healing. Devil would be the bad fruit. Disease. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's a very dualistic, there's black and white thing. In him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In him is no darkness at all. It's not a two-faced God. It's not a two-faced devil. Okay? The tree is either good or bad. The fruit is either good or bad. The good tree, good fruit. So healing, good tree. Healing, good fruit. Healing, that must be God. Because that's the good tree. That's the good fruit. My works, I'm showing good fruit. Okay? So either the tree is good and the fruit is good, or the tree is corrupt and the fruit is corrupt. You can't have a tr good tree with, good, with bad fruit and a bad tree with good fruit. Okay? You cannot have a devil that heals. This is the point that he's continuing to make. You cannot have a devil that heals. Healing comes from God. So now he continues. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So now he's even attacking them and saying, you're calling healing from the devil. So obviously you're corrupt. You're bringing forth bad fruit. You have, you have bad things in your heart. You have evil in your heart. You, and I know this because you speak the words that says the devil heals people. That's sick. That's demented. That's twisted. That is not good. That is not good theology. That is not good doctrine. He says, verse 35, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and thy words thou shalt be condemned. What is he talking about? This is actually not... not when you die and we have this big end of time ceremony and God says, okay, let me, let's review everything you've done. Cause although love keeps no record of wrongs, I do. Um, and you know, let's look at everything you said and we're going to condemn you, but for what you've said, no, this is set. He's condemning them right then and there for what their words are. He's saying, I, you have revealed yourself by your words. You've called healing from the devil. You know, so your words condemn you. Your words show what you have in your heart is evil because you can possibly call healing as being something from the devil. This is what he's talking about. What, you will be justified or condemned by people, not by God. Okay, for thy words thou shalt be justified and thy words thou shalt be condemned. But the key here is that what they've done is they've said that healing comes from the devil. And he's saying, you can't, I can't keep that without responding to that. I can't fail to respond to your accusation that I can possibly ever, or anybody could possibly ever, heal somebody by a power from the devil. Okay? Healing comes from God. And if you don't know that healing comes from God, you're going to be stuck. You're going to be completely trapped, not ever knowing forgiveness, not ever knowing liberty, not ever knowing freedom, constantly in vigilance, always wondering, always, always suspicious of everything that happens and wondering, is this really a blessing from God or is this a trick from the devil? That's why you don't have forgiveness when you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Because when you elevate the devil to the level of God and you take the power of God away from God and give it to the devil then you can never be sure. You can never be certain. You can never be secure. You can never have peace because you can't know for sure. Is this healing from God or from the devil? Is this thing that's giving me comfort from God or from the devil? Is this act of kindness from God or from the devil? When you take the power of God and give it to the devil, you can never know for certain. That's what it's talking about. It's not saying that when you die, God is going to be the devil and point a finger of accusation to you and say, you did this and I can't forgive it or won't forgive it. 